Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Ona Ferguson. This is the Peas Restoration Advisory Board meeting. We are in a hybrid meeting. We have maybe, you know, 20 or so people in the room and some people attending online as well. Um, we have a two hour meeting. We hope that everyone got a chance to watch the technical presentation either in advance, RAD members, as we sent it to you, or um, in the last hour and a half. And we're gonna start with just a little bit of technical detail of how this whole thing is gonna work. And then we will jump into content in a few minutes. Cameron. Yes, thank you everyone. I'm Cameron Hager. I'm part of the Consensus Building Institute and co-facilitating this meeting. So just to talk about the hybrid technology in the room, um, if you are online, you have a fairly simple setup. Uh, what we'll ask you to do is if you are a panelist, feel free to raise your virtual hand, which you can find under um, at the bottom of your toolbar there. Um, and feel free to use the chat as it's open to you as panelists. If you are a member of the public and you're an attendee, you should just have a raise hand button at the bottom, which we will do once we reach the public comment period. For any members of the public in the room, we would just ask you that uh, when you're ready to give public comment, um, raise your hand and you can sit next to me just so that the microphone in the room can hear you for the virtual members. And other than that, uh, it's a fairly straightforward meeting from there. If there are any questions, just feel free to let me know. Thank you, Cameron. We have a two hour conversation tonight we're going to do just a little bit of um, committee business, and then we're going to jump into open discussion with RAB members. Um, it's an opportunity to talk with the technical team about any and all of the presentations or other project um, issues. And then we'll get an update from um, Brian Getz, the municipal water update that we often do for a few minutes. And then we have public comment, and we will wrap up around eight o'clock. Questions about the agenda? Oh. All right, um, I would like to, let's do quick, sorry, I haven't been in this room in like three years doing this. <laughs> I know some of you were here in May. Um, let's do just quick introductions in the room so that everybody can hear and see who is present. And then those of you who are on Zoom can see the names of the panelists that way too. Um, let's go around the table and at the table is technical team and RAB members. And if you can just say where you fall and all of that. Uh, Jared Sheehan, RAB member for Peace Development Authority. Uh, I manage there and environmental management program. Brian Getz, city enforcement and the Peace water system. Operations Manager and Al Pratt, our water resources manager is here with me. He's the one that's going to provide the update. Sam Bay, I'm a Millington resident. Peter Sandin, I'm the uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Project Manager. Hank and Nelsick, I'm the uh, Project Hydrogeology for Peas uh, with WSP. And Maddie Dinsmore, I am a project chemist with WSP. I'm Amy Quentin, and I'm human health risk assessor with WSB. Grant Austin, project manager on the plant side of things for uh, WSB. Andrea Amico, Portsmouth resident on the Peas Rab. Cameron Hager, facilitator. And I'm Chris King, the Air Force Tech, which is a RAG environmental coordinator for Peas. And I think it's going to be tough to hear on the owl, but just so we know who's in the room, I'm actually going to ask everybody to just quickly go around and introduce yourself. If you can speak loudly, there's a chance they can hear you on Zoom. Just name an affiliation that will go around. I'm Deborah McDonald. I'm work on the Ashley Airport. Fred Santos, uh, also with ECC. <clears throat> Dave Roll with ECC. Grace Carmichael with ECC. Lauren Tierney with WSP. Uh, Nate Hogan, WSP. Brandon Shaw with WSP. Rob Singer, WSP. Al Pratt, Water Resource Manager, Portland. Thanks, everyone. Um, we are. Um, Should we introduce the people? Do you want to introduce? Do you want to? Do you want to run through the names? I know they can't all. Are there people virtual? Yeah. Sure thing. Uh, 
Uh, Mike Daly, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, Mike Daly here, um, EPA project manager. I'm sorry I'm not there tonight. Um, working on getting some kinks out of my back, but um, uh, glad to be here tonight. Michael Donahue. Good evening. Uh, nice to be with you again. And uh, I must say, I miss uh, Linda Geisinger, who did such a great job over the years working with us. Thanks, Mike. Um, Dante Gull. Hi, everybody. I'm Dante Gull, public affairs support contractor with the Air Force. Matthew Casey. Yep. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Casey. I'm the environmental manager for Pease Air National Guard Base. Um, good to see everybody virtually. Good to see you. I actually want to ask RAD members, if you're on virtually, can you please turn on your cameras? It gives us the best chance to pretend we're all in the same space, if it works. I know it doesn't always work for everybody all the time. Thank you. Uh, Kim McNamara. Kim, are you there? She's tending a pet also. I know there's something going on at her house. Okay. And Christina Harvey. Hey, good evening, everyone. I am with DOD, the Office of Secretary of Defense. Glad to be here. Perfect, everyone there. Great, thanks everyone. Um, RAB members, we'd like to approve the last meeting summary. We didn't hear any concerns about it, but now's your chance. We will post it as approved. Thank you all. Um, and I want to just give a very brief update on membership because every year, right around the new year, we do a check in with all the RAB members to ask. RAB members serve two year terms, they're renewable. Um, so at the end of each person's two-year term, we check in with them about whether they want to keep serving. That's for, we have community seats, and then we also have some appointed seats. So the appointed seats, they keep their appointments also for as long as they want. Um, we have had four RAD members step down in the last month or two. Joan Hamlet, Mindy Mesmer, Ted Connors, and Jean Schrager. I want to thank all of them so much for their time and attention and service on this board. Um, and we will post, we need to post an updated membership list, but we will do that um, as and when the co-chairs, Andrea and Chris, review the applicants' applications we received, and they have the decision-making power together to approve RAB members, and we'll come back and let you know kind of what the decision is and who our new members are um, before the next meeting or at the next meeting. So... That is the update on that, and we'll kind of update things on the website accordingly. Questions on any of the membership stuff? Cam, you're going to check the virtual stuff. Yeah, Brian. So <clears throat> this will be my last official meeting. What? Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Pratt, who has attended these meetings uh, tirelessly himself. Um, I'm not going away. It's just Al will uh, take over as uh, the representative, you know, I'm remaining director of water city, but uh, seven years, I, I was looking back, when did this start? So um, 2016 was the first meeting. That's right. Thank you for letting us know. Welcome Al, we're happy to have you. Officially. Officially. All right, I think that's all the business. Um, in a minute, we're gonna to go to open discussion where RAB members can raise any and all questions, comments, thoughts. We're gonna actually give the floor to Chris King for a few minutes to give a little bit of updated news on yes. some of the pieces from um, this. Amy, if you could share the slide. The slide about the National Defense Authorization Act 2023 was just recently updated as of today. I know during the presentation, I know that may that slide may have driven, you know, drawn some you know, you know, just confusion, maybe it was missing some information that we wanted to go ahead and update and share with the group to maybe, uh, you know, to kind of lead us into the open discussion. Um, 
what, what wasn't said in the slide before are basically the two bottom bullets that have been recently added. So um, as it was spoken on the slide, that may have been confusing. We we absolutely can shell well you know well sampling results with the group and other other data as well. Um, this information you know just the sample results themselves are not personally identifiable information. That PII personal identifying for personally identifying information includes the name and the physical address of the sampling location, whether that be soil or water well or any other type of media like with the backyard privilege that you're all familiar with. Um, so we cannot share that without the private property owner's consent. Um, to date, we don't have consent from most property owners. Um, we're going to be looking to possibly get that via you know, alternative means, but right now we do not have that data, so we are restricted from sharing that PII exclusively. Um, right now, uh, the DOD is discussing the best way to proceed. We will share more information and with you about uh, that data and how it can be shared when it's available. Right now, the DOD is a, their discussions are being made at a very high level. It's not just to affect peace, but to do basically a DOD wide <coughs> decision so that we're all consistent throughout all the services in the Air Force, Navy, et cetera. Um, and so, with that, I would like to just kick it open then, open discussions for the RAD members. If you have any questions, please ask away. And so, RAD, those of you in the room, if oh, you want to. I do apologize. I had been asked to give. Um, Ms. McKenna, if you wanted to jump in from Senator Shaheen's office, if you had anything that you wanted to build, just ask to give you a moment or so to respond to the new updated slide. You should be allowed to talk now. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks, Chris, for that update um, to the slide. Uh, I'll, I'll just share a quick background, too, on our end when we saw the slides. Um, that you shared with us a couple of weeks ago, uh, we immediately jumped right on that to reach out to the Air Force, because as you all know, when we were informed of the NDAA change from last year, Senator Shaheen worked really closely with a number of stakeholders, New Hampshire DES and the Air Force to make sure that we could come to a resolution on this. And we were told that this language would work. Um, so we were definitely glad to see that um, that it's been updated as of today. Um, and we're just, we'll continue to make sure that this is, uh, works for the community in Pease um, and that the Air Force continues to work with New Hampshire DES and the community members on the RAB to make sure that folks um, are getting the data that they need and information that they need uh, to make sure that this, you know, that this is successful. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so logistically, if you're in the room and you want to speak, you can put your card up um, and I can make sure you get in the queue. And if you're virtual panelists, committee members, you can put your virtual hand up and Cameron will make sure we get you into the discussion. And I see Andrea's card, so let's start there. Sure. Um, thank you very much for the update, Chris and Elizabeth, also for your comments and for Senator Shaheen's work on this. Um, you know, I guess for me, it, it seems like we're moving in the right direction in terms of getting the DOD to be able to share more data with the community. I also recognize the privacy concerns and, you know, people not wanting their personal information out there, but I think we need to strike the balance of being able to share information with the community so we can better understand the contamination in our communities. And for us to meaningful, be able to meaningfully engage in this process, we need to be able to see more data, you know? So I hope that, um, again, this slide is better than the first slide that was in the presentation. Um, and I just hope that we can continue to work together to find a resolution that does protect people's privacy while also sharing meaningful information with the community so we can engage in this process in a way that feels helpful and feels like we truly understand what con contamination is being found and where in our own communities, because that's really important to the process. So. For sure. And with that, um, Amy, do you have access to that graphic? The, uh, the map, yes. The map, yes, yes sorry. And so happen. along those lines, Andrea, so we've um, come up with a graphic for you that's, that we can share with everybody um, in a way that does protect PII, and we'd like to display that for the group just to give everybody an idea of how this data is being displayed. Bear with us. Bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, the video is not showing up on my share. Yeah. 
Pink coming. Here we go. All right. All right. So in this graphic, if you can zoom out just to just yeah. start it all out. So you can see that this is all of our can't see the legend. This is all groundwater data in and around the former base. So as you as as you know, what is currently former peas is all currently occupied and managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service, National Guard, and the PDA. Those are non-restricted data points. And so you'll see we in this graphic, once it comes online, as you'll see that we, we can display full Google Earth overlays along with the data. And then beyond what is the former base is what really encompasses, you know, mixed private lands and such like that. So then we kind of we went with the we call it grayed out, but it's really more pinkish depiction of, of those locations. So that this way you we're protecting that PII. You can see generally where the samples are taken, but you can't necessarily attribute it with any one private land. And so along with this way, this also presents the data in a, in a color coded format. So you can see basically the ranges of exceedances where there are uh, based on the color. So the darker the color, generally the greater the exceedance. You can see site eight where it's all black. That's obviously a hot spot. That's a major source area right there. And then from there, the colors tend to become less and less going towards green where they're pretty much not necessarily not detect, but underneath the RSLs uh, for the given chemical that this map will be dead. <clears throat> so you can see this is this provides a lot of information in it over the, the entire peninsula. And uh, this is the type of graphic that we're looking to be able to share once, once all the data is finally approved and ready to go. Just to ask a follow-up question for, on this topic. Um, I know in the past, this was impacting New Hampshire DES's ability to receive information. Will any of this change or solve that issue for DES? And is this presenting challenges for you to do your job, Peter? I'm still a little unclear exactly on what it is that I will be allowed to receive. Um, so is it true that I will be getting redacted reports? You'll be getting graphics like this that are, you know, that are stripped of the PI. Okay. Yes. Uh, I really can't see that. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a large scale. I'll, I'll need to see it in paper to, to make a better determination. Um, you know, from understanding the say, conceptual model and the distribution of contaminants, this goes, this is a step in the right direction for me to be able to uh, evaluate that and, and uh, perform those duties. This doesn't, by being withheld of the actual uh, property addresses and property owners, those are actually requirements of our own environmental uh, contaminant site management rules where we're supposed to be notified of, of uh, exceedances on some of the property within 24 hours for drinking water sampling, for instance, uh, so that we can serve those properties. Uh, one question I have is, as I understand what's been uh, sent down to us is that the DOD is no longer uh, seeking to reach agreements for sharing data with individual states. Is that the case? I don't know if anybody on the line that can answer that. Okay. Um, what I know is that um, yeah, we currently do not have an agreement in place with the state, and I don't believe one's being pursued at this moment. Okay. At least by the Air Force. Yeah. And the way I, the way I was it was explained to me earlier was that there, that was an avenue that the state could pursue with DOD uh, to reach an agreement where data wouldn't be shared publicly, but the state would would be receiving okay. those. Uh, but those agreements were pulled back or withheld, and I'm just curious if that's something that would be uh, could change moving forward, so that we could receive <laughs> completely unredacted uh, data or not. Yeah, I wish I could answer that. That's an OSD level question. That's yeah. it's well above my uh, ability to answer. That would that would be the most ideal for me personally. If if the if if if, if the laws as they are written uh, prevent the public from getting full disclosure on on uh, the PII. Then I would hope that we could reach an agreement with DOD so that we can uh, get all the information that we need to to be able to serve the people of New Hampshire. Sure. So uh, I see Christina Harvey raising her hand. Do you want? Do you have a point to add to that? Christina, uh, I just wanted to. Yep, I just wanted to address some of the the, the questions that uh, the gentleman had asked with regards to state agreements. Um, so we are at the OSD level 
uh, we had looked into doing state specific agreements. What we found is that many of the states don't afford the same uh, protections to PII that federal entities do. So whereas DOD was able to enter into a memorandum of understanding with EPA and it, other federal agencies, they are required to manage PII um, information and data in a very specific way. The states don't necessarily, not all states, necessarily have those same protections for PII. So that's why we have advised as a generality to not, um, to not assume or fall back on, on that type of approach. Now, what we are looking to do and what we're trying to explore are different opportunities that we can still um, share the information, um, even specific information by um, talking with homeowners, um, especially in, in certain locations where the state is offering um, resources if, if levels are above a certain, um, a certain threshold. We are providing the opportunity for homeowners to, to share their PII with the state. Um, we are looking at those options and what we can do to help share and facilitate the information with the states. We really do want to provide um, as much information as, as, as necessary so that um, not only we can show all the efforts that we've done, but that regulators and our partners, our stakeholders can uh, to, can really get confidence and, and understand what they're looking at and what data has been collected. So um, there is more to come and we will try to provide those updates through each of the RABs and each of the installations. Thank you. Other, so RAB members, and this is your chance to continue this conversation and also to ask questions about any of the technical presentations or any of the information in the newsletters that Chris has been putting out every month. What do you want to know? What didn't you quite understand? This is highly technical. It's expected that not everybody has the same types of expertise. So if you have a question, probably other people have the same questions. So just basic on the um, GIS data that Chris was just showing, is that I assume the raw data will be provided as much as possible at some point? Yeah, the DOD is working well. on that to, to clarify some things on that. Like I said, they're trying to get their hands wrapped around the yeah. PI issues and how to properly, uh, you know, and uniformly display that, you know, throughout all the routes throughout the and country. Then, so. so in terms of mapping, there was like a pink area, but in terms of the raw data, that would be like... Uh, Redacted in terms of just being a generalized area like North Billington. Something or, like that, yeah. The exact or final nature of it is still to be determined. We're working on that, but yes, that, that like I said, that data from the samples is not PII in and of itself. And so it, it can and it will be shared yeah. when it's the format and everything is, uh, is finalized. Brian, go ahead. So um, <clears throat> as far as the usefulness of the data, um, is monitoring continuing or people dropping off or are you still monitoring quarterly annually on the so residential kind of, wells and yeah, residential wells are all monitored on a, on a program depending on either semi-annually or annually depending on the level of and then what systems are in place and all that but yes they are continually monitored okay um, the ri is obviously the sampling is coming to a close for the ri but that's not to say that monitoring is not going to continue in the future especially when the feasibility study comes along it's going to be a big part of it still and the, but yeah the private private wells are well monitored we have a hand from mike down here mike go ahead mike down here you want to unmute sorry for the delay um, but it's really nothing compared to the way this um, particular issue has been handled. For, I've been on the wrap for four years. I make these comments really for the public. Um, I'm not going to say anything to the Air Force that they haven't already heard. Um, this is this is continues to be extremely disappointing in you know, in going through the slides in preparation for this meeting, um, I found the information to be um, difficult to relate. Were I to be have the opportunity to speak with citizens of Newington to assure them that the Air Force 
was doing the best job they could on this project and was actively uh, seeking to address it. This lack of information leaves us as ineffective advisors to you. We're, we, we've been in this since the beginning with one arm tied behind our back. And to hear tonight that it's, it's moved over so that our state officials who many times at, at these meetings, we've looked to, to provide uh, an independent uh, judgment on some of these issues to learn that they don't have the information they need and can't get it. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's great that Christina mentioned, you know, going back to the, uh, uh, to the individuals whose consent you need, uh, but th that's an idea that was, I, I, I put it forward four years ago. To be here today, I, I, I'm inclined to say we should continue this meeting until we can get graphic information that provides information about what is the extent of the contamination in Newington. That's what this affects. It affects, it, it all relates to Newington in this particular case, because that's where the private landowners are. It's worse than that in the sense that the state of New Hampshire isn't able to get the information that they need, that they require of every other site that they deal with. I represented site owners, I've represented uh, municipalities. It's impossible to participate in this process with, without more openness about this information. I, thank you. I appreciate that you'll you know, provide a form for me to say that, but I, I, I'm discouraged and disappointed that that's what, I, that's what I'm here saying again. Thanks, and, and, you know, change slides at the last minute and, and tell us, I, I mean, I, I haven't even been able to read the slide, the new slide, but um, having heard the comments about it, it clearly doesn't solve anything. Thank you, Mike. Um, Andrea, you want to jump in? I just, yeah, I just had a follow-up question to this information. So, like, we know that the EPA is in the process of setting new advisories for PFOA and PFOS. So I just want to make sure I understand, should those levels get set much lower, which we anticipate that they will, and the Air Force has tested private wells that they won't share that information with DES, like how can we be sure that residents who may have exceedances once the new MCLs are set, how can we be sure that those homes will be intervened on? How can we be sure that DES is going to know about them? How do we even know if the Air Force will comply with them? You know, like, I guess that I'm just worried that there's a lot of wells that have been tested, and we know some that were above New Hampshire, but below EPA, there was disagreements initially about intervening, and then those homes did get intervened on, which was great. But can you tell me, will that become a problem this data sharing limitation, will this become a problem in the future, the near future when these MCLs are set and some of these wells could potentially now be at levels that are not considered safe? How would we know that? And how would we, how could we be sure DES is able to oversee the Air Force intervening in those homes? Well, the DES does get private well data. It's just, uh, you know, it's the P&I redacted versions of the, of the report. So should that come, come to be, <laughs> He would definitely be able to, the state would definitely be able to see that there are wells that are being impacted over a newly accepted um, EPA EPA levels. And at that point, you know, it's, you know, everything's redacted that has a res 59 or res 21 or, you know, some sort of coded number in there. And then, of course, we would have to act on that as well. Um, yeah, so they, they're they not, none so of that they will be being, notified, but they won't know exactly where, is correct. what you're saying. Uh, they won't know the, they'll know how metrics. many. Yes. Okay. If I, if I understood Christina correctly, one of the things you're looking at, though, would be to, in that case, 
uh, seek permission from the property owner that we then be uh, provided all of the information so that we can. Right, if they give us that, then yes, I mean, yeah. we're for sure everything. Like this, we have attempted with several, you know, the more modern um, access agreements, and we nobody wanted to sign that form. So I, I, I hope that changes. But, you know, I'm certain. You know, when we get to the actual private landowners drinking water wells, and that's maybe that would change. Maybe their edits would be different than some of the ones we've seen recently. Where it was a pretty hard no. Um, but yeah, that's the effort is it's worthwhile. So we're going to have to look into that about going out again and yet again asking for permission. But like I said, so far today we have none. Others. I feel like we're like kind of feeling the elephant, kind of identifying <laughs> right. who we are. <laughs> okay. Questions about the 3D model that was shown or about the plants and the eggs and any of that. Andrea, I, have, I do have a list of questions. Um, at first, I guess I just want to mention to this group um, that I have worked with Mike Daly and the EPA. I think there are some grants available to RAVs to provide technical assistance. And I think we're at an opera, we're at a you know a point in time where I think us having some independent technical assistance would be really helpful for our community RAV members, just because I think we've lost some really seasoned, knowledgeable RAV members recently. And there's all this data coming out, and some of it we don't even have all the data, but um it just I think it's a good opportunity to try to pursue some independent technical assistance. And so I've worked with Mike Daly and we, the Keys Rep community members have a meeting on January 31st from six to seven with Bob Shuwak with EPA Region One uh, to talk about different options. And so I just wanted to put that up to the group. That is something some team members have expressed interest in. And I think it would be beneficial for a group at this time to have more scientific expertise who can help the community members interpret all this data that's being collected. Thank you. I think it came up. And I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but okay, maybe not. So Andrea, if anybody missed those emails, all of our members are welcome. Yeah, I mean, I think it's for the community rad members, but I think, yeah, whoever. Right. Yeah, got it. Yeah. But, yeah, um, just to clarify, it, it's community. It doesn't have to be, it's not just the RAB, but it can be anybody within the community that, you know, has, would like to sort of, um, or have an interest in. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's a couple vehicles. Uh, one allows uh, the community to hire their own consultant, um, and EPA reimburses uh, the cost of the consultant. Um, and there's sort of, uh, Certain costs or most costs are covered, but certain things are not. Um, those, but those are clearly um, delineated. And then uh, we also have an, another little more avail easily more easily available uh, consultant that uh, can provide. Uh, it's an EPA consultant, but can provide the services similar to uh, a consultant that the community would hire um, through. So that, that the the tag technical assistance grant is something where the community can hire their own consultant and then uh, something called task uh, technical assistance for Superfund communities, I believe, is for where we can have a, it's a lot more uh, quick, streamlined, uh, easier, uh, where there's already a consultant available to the community um, and they can task that community, uh, task, they can task the consultant, the task consultant to uh, review stuff. So, uh, so that those are the couple things that we can go into greater detail um, we have a scheduled call uh, on the 31st, so we can provide some more details and what may work for the community. So, uh, and, and, I, and I explained to Andrea too, this is a good opportunity. I, I think we're in a, you know, it's never, well, it's never too late to sort of, you know, get this kind of support, this uh, help um, to, to basically interpret some of the stuff. And it is, it's hard. There's no question about it. Um, it's hard for ever, even for me at this point. Uh, and what's interesting about this project, it's it's such a large, it's it's basically, you know, well, it's probably, well, at least the size of the base, you know, 4,300 acres and then some as you as you look into the town of Newington. So there's a, there's a lot of data. There's a lot of data, a lot of information. So um, a consultant can help a lot in interpreting the stuff uh, for the community. So um, 
so that so that it, it you know is still will be a draft will be an RI report at some point later in the year. So um, the information that's available now can certainly be sort of um, reviewed and evaluated and then interpreted uh, for the community, and and uh, that would sort of get them on a trajectory to when the report comes out, uh, they'd have a nice sort of baseline of information. Because uh, there's a lot of information out there now. There's been a lot of reports thus far, you know, uh, generated by BF4. So there's a lot of good information um, that you could sort of get a nice primer for uh, the, the eventuality of getting an RI report. So. Thank you. I'm go. Did you say you have a? I, I have more. Yeah. Kim's there... hand is up, so I'm happy to take. Kim, break. why don't you jump in? Thanks. I just would like Mike to clarify the EPA provides the funding, but they don't, it's not their consultant and they don't choose the consultant. Correct. We get to choose the consultant. They just pay for it. That's the technical assistance grant. Um, the other thing that what I mentioned was the technical assistance for uh, Superfund communities. That's where we have, there is a consultant that's sort of, I'll call it, I'll use the term I'll like on retainer, but it's available for the communities to task and review stuff so there's a couple there's a couple options the tag has a little more sort of a little more to do's with it um i've had i've had experience with both so it depends on what the community wants what they're looking for um and like i said the, the tag has a little bit more there's more to do's there to sort of to get um to get set up to sort of start the um sort of get the money flowing so um, but i can we'll get, we can go into that and you know, really good detail um, on the 31st. So, okay, thank it, you. Yeah, so it, it's they both work. They're both. I've seen them both in action, and um, it just depends on what the community is willing to sort of, um, you know, what they're looking to do. So, thank you, Andrea. Over to you and your questions. Um, I had some questions for Amy about the vegetable data. So you had mentioned the drought and how that kind of created some problems this summer. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, do you still feel like you got a comprehensive sampling set given the drought? And would you want to do additional sampling? Uh, it sounds like you probably couldn't given timing with reports, but do you still, do you feel like that negatively impacted your ability to get a comprehensive sample set? Our objective mostly this year had been confirmation. We did do a little bit of expansion, but because most of it was just confirming that we didn't detect anything the year before, I think we feel pretty comfortable with it. Um, you know, we haven't done full analysis yet. Maybe when we look at it, you know, as I said, there was a little bit more detected this year. We're going to look into maybe what could have caused that. Um, if there's anything that we think is site related or, you know, if drought makes a difference, we don't, we don't really know. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, um, Another question I had was, how did you report this information back to the homeowners? Because I had heard like some folks got letters maybe, and <clears throat> was there an opportunity to people have like a phone call? Because I I didn't see what the report back looked like, but like I can draw a comparison to blood testing and it's super confusing and not easy to read or interpret. So I'm just curious what the report back was to homeowners who participated and if people are still confused, how can they reach out to get more help in understanding the results? Yeah, I mean, they can reach, I believe, yeah. I believe, uh, well, Chris can yeah, talk about I saw all the letters that go out, so they have absolutely all of my contact, and I, I encourage them to call me if there are questions. And if, if it comes across, they have a question that's way over my head and I require Amy's help, then I'll get around the conference call as well. And the, that RI email address and, and phone number are still active. So if someone, someone can also contact us there, you know, so that that. Either way, there are there are multiple avenues. So just to be clear, it's just letters that went out though. Like phone calls didn't get made to these homes to walk them through this information. No. There's a letter with like with charts or something. Yeah, with all of their results in comparison. If, there, if there's an over screening level for that particular media, then that's in there as well. So they can have something to compare it against. Okay. And if people do have follow-up questions, they should start with you first. Yes. Okay. Um, and I have fielded several phone calls, usually now with the so, some mostly water, but the yeah, I have it, it does happen. Okay. Um, I think the next is just more, I guess, a general comment in the sense that I understand that we can't always see the specific locations of where data was collected, but sometimes I feel like 
the information presented to us is too vague in the sense that it doesn't always, it doesn't share every PFAS test before and like a range. And sometimes it just focuses on a handful of PFAS and maybe that's just all you're detecting, but I feel like that's an ongoing um, gap for me where we just, I don't think we're always getting all the information and just a comment and I guess feedback for future presentations. If, if it could be set up with, you know, here's all the PFAS we tested for, here's all the ones that we detected and here's the range of what we found. Um, I don't know. I just sometimes feel like the information is lacking and it seems vague to me. So just give you that. Um, the other question is for Grant. So at the site eight, you talked about trenches being replaced and you said A through D was decommissioned, but one through five was constructed. How many trenches are there total? Like, I guess I wasn't clear. Is A through B the only trenches and you did all new ones or are there still other trenches, old trenches? And it, so, yes. So the new construction consisted of five new trenches replacing trench A, trench B, trench C, trench D, four trenches which were decommissioned. Okay. Or closed out uh, for access. There's one remaining trench, trench E from, from the old structure okay. that we have the opportunity to use if, if, if needed. We currently do not do not direct flow to that trench E, which is on the, from the far northwestern side of the, of the spark area there at site eight. But we do have option to use it. So they've been replaced with five new active trenches that, that far exceed the capacity of what what the plant will essentially produce for effluent, and additionally, it, it's it far exceed what we had actively working at the time we were placed. We were down to effectively two trenches. These were trenches we piggybacked on when we came in and built the, and built the plant. They were, they were not even system. Oh, okay. So they, they had some age to them. Um, that was identified in eighteen. We knew that that replacement was on the table and that came to fruition really in spring of this year okay so you replaced them because they were kind of old and outdated that's correct and they weren't functioning as well that's as correct time. so okay. the, the, the way that the, the effluent leaves the plant we have options to to inject that water into the capture to flush the to flush the system um when our options kind of narrowed slowly over the course of the last couple again this goes back to 2018 when we recognized that the testing was done. We recognized that this was the big issue. Okay. So, as our options narrowed, it was time to engage the Air Force and say, it's time to replace these trenches. It's time to put a design on the table. It's time to put a design on the table. It's time to put a design, which happened right around Thanksgiving, 2018. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. Sure. Um, I have two other questions. So, I want to. Um, Chris, for you in the RI report, like, can you walk us through the timeline a little bit in a little bit more detail? And can you explain the stops along the way where we as the community member are going to get to view the reports? And like, will we have the ability to provide any comments on them? Um, I know there was talk, I think, of like a draft report in the spring that the regulators will get to see, and then we'll get to see a report at the community level in the fall. So anyways, if you could just like help us better understand the reports that are coming out this year and the timeline. Yeah, sure. And please jump in if I'm, I'm off on this thing. But yeah, so the, the draft is it's, it's in works right now. And we're actually, because this is such a uh, complex RI and there's basically you know, two water divides, we're gonna do them in sections just to keep things moving. So we're gonna do our internals. The Air Force obviously gets the first crack at it before it goes to the regulators. And then at that point, they have their, I believe it's 90 day review period for the RI reports, Peter. Uh, got it all off the top of my head. <laughs> but anyway, so then they get they, they do 90 45 days. Okay, so thank you. It's our regular. I can't imagine they can leave this thing in 45 days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to be a doozy. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we you know we compile the okay, comments and we respond to them. Uh, the Air Force team will respond to them, and however long that may take, then they get an opportunity to review them and, and you know accept or argue against how the comment was resolved. And then once the, the Air Force team and the regulators are on file, come to terms when the final report can be made available and that's when the public will have access to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's final. Yeah. So, yes. but in terms of timeline, the first <clears throat> pass 
will happen where they the regulators will see it is this spring is what you're hoping for yeah it's late spring summer early summer right? uh, i think currently it's june first or beginning of june sometime i believe uh, yeah. or is that no that's the air force Yes, yeah. you the Air Force gets it. You guys get it. No, you'll burn, so. Okay, so you'll get it June first. The regulators get it when? Same time? No, they'll get it after the Air Force makes okay. it run through it as well. So we want to make sure that our our internal comments are addressed before those external. Mm -hmm. And then when can we, as the community member members, expect to see it? Um, that's going to be at the end of the fall. The end of the fall right. of this year. Right after the after all the comments are done. I can't really promise a deadline because if there's a lot of comments that go unresolved, it could go to it could go into you know further discussions or mediation or something like that. So it could take longer to get to final. We hope not. We've been working hand in hand with our regulators the entire time, so we feel we're all on the same page and we feel this process should go fairly well. And are the regulators' comments made available to the community? Do we get to see what they comment on? They always have been. Yeah. Okay. I would hope they would be. I'm sorry, you looking for an answer for me? <laughs> uh, no, you just were off mute, so I wasn't sure if you uh, had a question. Uh, yeah, no, no, like we, yes, we can certainly share those. And um, yeah, the, 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 you know, it's, you know, I, I can't think of a time where we've had, you know, this, this, such an expansive, um, again, it, it doesn't really exist uh, uh, in the library for peas. There is a lot of, uh, we, what we did is we parsed out the uh, call operable units. So there's a lot of RIs. You'll see numerous RIs for a lot of these sites that have, uh, I'll call them the legacy sites that have been studied, uh, remediated, and then there's been a, a number of optimization efforts. And uh, so, you know, and those are ongoing. So, um, so yes, this will be a, a pretty expansive, it, it will cover, you know, it covers the 4,300, you know, I'm just coming up with the, the base originally was 4,300 acres, but um, you know much of that still is retained. Uh, it's much of it with PDA, and then again we have much more uh, real estate that this contamination has sort of um, spilled onto Newington. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be a quite, and it's gonna, and it's going to be a multimedia. It, it's uh, you know again, and this is not uh, again this is untypical of a lot of other RI reports. But we have a number of media that we've never even evaluated through the other legacy uh, programs, uh, program such as again produce, um, so eggs, you know. So there's a lot of things. So it, it will be a, a big report, and with big reports inevitably come lots of comments. So I, I think what Chris was trying to say is, as we try to nail down timelines, um, yeah, they, there could be a number of comments from from either me and or. A DES that will have to get resolved. And, and sometimes, as Chris suggested, sometimes there's a dispute that arises out of it because it's a it's a it's a report of consequence. We call it a primary document of the Federal Facilities Agreement. Uh, but with that said, you know, again, we have been working hand in hand. We've been collaborative. So, you know, I'm hoping, Chris is hoping, I'm sure Pete's hoping we don't have any of those major sort of uh, impasses with regard to what the report is, uh, what, what the report contains, and if there's any sort of issues that, you know, hopefully there's no issues that we have that will have to be adjudicated uh, through the process that we have. Um, so hopefully that won't be the case, but uh, it is, it is a, it's a bit hard to sort of necessarily define, and, uh, you know, 45 days will probably be not enough, at least for me, and probably, I don't want to speak for Pete, but yeah, that's, there's going to be a lot of information. So uh, we do have the ability to request extension under the Federal Facilities Agreement. That probably will be the case. So uh, I'm just trying to give some, apply some realistic sort of expectations on, because of the size of the report, it, it, it'll be significant. So. Okay. I have one more question. Yeah. Um, I was just curious, kind of going back to the new EPA MCLs and guidance that may should be hopefully coming out soon. How would that decision or those, you know, how would that impact this report and any conclusions that are drawn? Because a lot of information is kind of drawn on current information, the current guidance or health advisories. And so if the EPA were to come out with much lower levels, Drinking water, um, would that change the conclusions of some of these reports? Or if this report is already kind of, you know, almost complete, 
is there an addendum be done like where we have this kind of hanging over our heads this epa decision that's coming soon how could that impact the work that's being done here could it delay it could it change conclusions in the future i uh, i'm going to speak i don't want to cut chris off but i, I will say uh, and again i don't know what the new then again i don't know what the draft rulemaking mcls will be um I can tell you that the numbers that we're relying on, uh, which are which are regional screening levels, are pretty low, uh, in, in the range of I believe four parts per trillion. I think for P4, P4. Uh, Amy can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but that's quite low. And you know, so as far, from a delineation standpoint, we're trying to use the lowest of everything, at least through. And I think the slides sort of try to depict. I think the lowest of all these things that we have currently, but I mean, this is what I've been saying. I think we've all been collectively saying this has been the struggle as we try to sort of conduct this work. We're constantly trying to adjust on the fly to, again, these emerging contaminants. So yes, we've been doing this um, constantly. I think, we, you know, every data set uh, that we've collected, which inevitably had to go back and review it and compare it against the latest and greatest. So. Um, so with that said, I, I would expect, uh, you know, if, if indeed EPA does release uh, uh, these draft MCLs, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm hoping they're sufficiently low enough, at least what we're using now, to sort of delineate those that these areas. But it could, it could, it could require some some additional, perhaps some some tweaking if if, if need be. Um, so that that could be that's a possibility, but. Um, we're so low now in terms of our sort of screening. Um, yeah, it's like, how low can you go? So I guess we'll see. Okay. And just to be clear, Mike, what the EPA is doing next is putting out draft MCLs. They're not definite, right? So then what does that look like in terms of, you know, is that like a year or, you know, what can we expect on the community side of the next step with the EPA in that process? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you, but uh, you were asking about um, how the process goes after the drafts are released. Is that was that the question? So the next step is the draft MCLs come out, right? Yes, right. And how long are those in draft form before they become permanent? You know, like uh, well, there's, there's going to be a. I can imagine it's, it'll go for public comment, and like all these things, um, there's always a significant public comment because there's a lot of interested parties. Uh, that will have a lot of interest, a lot of things to sort of say and, and comment on. So I, you know, with, with regard to these, I, I imagine there'll be a lot of comments, um, um, given 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 the fact that they are emerging contaminants. So um, so yeah, I, I, I wish I could say I I, I really don't know, um, but I think these te again with I think this, these classic chemicals seem to generate anything surrounding them seems to generate quite a bit of comment. So. Um, you know, the, the drafts, I, I suppose, in, in, in regards to the draft numbers, I, you know, again, we would, I think, practically, we'd have to consider those and those would be part of our screening or our consideration of, as we consider nature and extent of contamination. So um, for groundwater anyway, drinking water, groundwater. So, um, but yeah, I, I really don't know. It, it, it's, um, I can only imagine um, there'll probably be a significant, you know, significant comment. And then those comments have to be, uh, they have to be, you know, responded to, and they have to be uh, published. And so, yeah, it takes a while. And, and sometimes the, the MCL, sometimes they're, um, they don't become effective immediately. So there could be a, a period of time when they do eventually become effective. So, um, so that it allows, for instance, water suppliers to sort of, uh, you know, adjust, make, be able to basically meet, meet the standards. It gives them a, a period of time to uh, make the changes. So, um, but you know that's the process generally. I, I just couldn't tell you exactly how long it could be before the draft become uh, eventually final. So, you want to Air Force? Do you want to respond to any of the questions about how that fits or what you're expecting? Or well, I just also wanted to, to you know just make mention that we have pivoted. You know, when, they, when those RSLs that Mike was just talking about came out, we did adjust it. We you know, that was earlier this year when they popped when they dropped down, and then we did adjust our step out well so that we could go out there and capture them. So that being said, with this is all going on while the IRA report's being done, you know, it's it's possible, yeah, we would have to take a step back and go out there and do more delineation. It's, we'll have to wait and see. Like Mike said, those RSLs are really low. And we're, you know, at least I'm hoping that the, the, new, <laughs> the new standards aren't, aren't below those, but then we'll have to wait and see. But like I said, there is precedent. We have done that already. And, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Well, we I mean, follow the law. That's yeah, how it is. Right. But I mean, the, the current health advisory is in the parts per quadrillion or something, right? So it's like for the EPA, for the drinking water. So I know what you're saying, but like based on what the EPA has already put out this year, mm -hmm. or last, I guess last year, it it's below part per trillion. So I, I, I recognize four is very low, but that's the EPA is still going much lower than that right now for PFOA and PFOS, at least in their current health advisory, which I know isn't set in stone, but there is a big difference, I guess, in my opinion, um, between four and, you know, part per quadrillion. So mm -hmm. just something we should be prepared for. And, and again, just general curiosity of how that could affect some of the conclusions that are being made in this report. Certain levels are, you know, safe, but then all of a sudden they're not safe. Then what, you know, so. Right, understood. <clears throat> I think it would have its biggest implications in the in the water, the drinking water results, both mm -hmm. public and uh, private wells. Right. So, sure. We had a question in chat from Kim. Uh, what is the background concentration of PFAS in the environment in non-point sources such as rainwater? And feel free to come off mute if you want to add to that. I don't I don't remember what that I won't say natural concentration is, but that ubiquitous concentration is. Uh, does anybody remember? Yeah, I don't we haven't sampled for it at peace, but I I I in literature searches, I, I I've come across a number of like Three ppt or something like that. I mean, it's 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 low. It's 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 low, but it's detectable. So there's a lot of research being done, and there are certain states that are starting to think about setting background numbers um, based on research that they're doing. So there is, you know, I think that's. I don't think there's a set in stone number at this point. But well, since it seems really impossible to find water sources that haven't been contaminated by PFAS, you know, across the globe. The simplest approach wouldn't wouldn't it be to just know what that background is environmentally, globally, and use that instead of all these changing concentrations? Because we are the restoration advisory board. We would like the aquifer restored to its condition prior to when all this went into the water, and we can't get to zero. But it seems like a lot of time and effort and energy has gone into this discussion now uh, for a few years and progress is definitely being made, but it feels a little wasteful because we should just shoot for the moon here. Let's just restore the aquifer to what we can get it to as an environmental concentration naturally. You know, we're stuck with PFAS in the environment. So uh, just my thought, thank you. Thank you. responses or additional comments or questions. I would say for people in participants who are in the public, if you're going to want to make public comment, that might be coming sooner rather than later. Just heads up on that. Yeah, Samuel. I have a question for uh, Mike about your predicted concentrations and the graphs you showed um, about PFAS moving through the Haven well, and you said there was a, a slug predicted years and I was wondering maybe I missed it but was there a source and expected destination I guess of the slug and well I mean the the uh, the haven well is in the middle of the plume right yeah. now and that's and, and that plume is a lot of heterogeneity within that plume and you if you move up gradient there's mm -hmm. uh, you know there's it's not a constant concentration gradient and there's pockets here and there and so sure. You know, the model predicted that there's there's a uh, I think it was a, there's a slight decline and then there was going to be a slight increase come through and then it went down in concentration yep. then it went up a little bit and then it started steadily steadily going down and that's the result of just the heterogeneity of the of the of the water upgrading of that. Yeah, um, I don't know without looking at the map which specific point source is responsible for the contamination of sin. Well, it's you know it's like, it's. Site eight is contributing to it. Uh, the the, uh, the fire equipment test area is contributing to it. 
uh, the firing range. Those are the big three big players. All fresh, fresh. Crack, uh, mm -hmm. mainly uh, current crash station. I think is uh, yeah, the crash stations okay. are to a lesser degree. Uh, okay, so What's that? You're the top uh, Yeah, that sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. I can have to share. Hopefully, I don't like. I know you can see the map in your head. I, I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> in my, I don't know if I'm sharing. This is basically the, Not yet. the Not yet. hydrologic flow, just containing yeah. those contaminants and moving across the place where it is. Yes. Through the bedrock. Yes. And uh, this would be pretty good in one. Sorry, everybody. Technical pause. Right there, I got it. Thank you. All right. A little challenge technically sometimes in these things, but uh, it wouldn't be a rad meme without. Hank needs assistance with this stuff. So remember, I think it's going to be tiny on most people's screens. Okay. So you really got to orient them. Yeah. So let me. I'll zoom in here. It will, let me see if I can. Um, uh, like features. Let's see. There's Haven Well. So we're talking about that right now. I'll zoom in a little bit. And I'll put on here um, uh, water table contours. There's some water table contours, and I'm going to put on um, some source areas. And can you speak a little louder, please? Yeah, sorry. So, okay. So, uh, here's the Haven Well, and we have uh, uh, these areas up here. The purple areas are known or potential source areas. Uh, this is the uh, former crash fire station here, uh, and this is the current crash fire station, and those are uh, have, have been identified in the report uh, um, as as uh, as source areas. They're not as uh, significant as uh, this is like eight up here. This is a significant source area, and then these two source areas here. This is the firing firing range and the uh, uh, fire equipment test area. So from from a groundwater flow perspective here, let me just make this a little bit bigger. And um, this is this on this area here, this is a mound. So this is actually going in all different directions here. But from a from a uh, impact to uh, you know the, the southern flow area, this is coming down in this direction here. These guys are coming down like this, as well as this is coming right down through that site area. Site eight and the stuff up here is 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 coming right down through here. Um, that's this is the KC 135 crash site. So you can see there's several. These are kind of merging sites, uh, merging flow lines of groundwater. So now you have contamination that's moving down, and you know and it gets it gets pulled in. Uh, they just run it backwards from here. I'll go you know. Just, like that, the flow line is already the table well, and there's a capture zone around here that you know these things kind of get pulled into, and that's what our model is showing. You know, uh, and so the, the distribution of contamination in this whole area is not is not consistent. You have high levels and lower levels and pockets of contamination and so on, and so that's what that's what we're seeing this model result. So. Yeah, so you have a good model prediction on, on the point of the payment well. I'm wondering if that model is also able to show where these slugs or areas are going to move through after that and then go, I guess, toward Greenland or wherever. They... Yes, and, and that's what, it, you know, yes, and we, we usually are not, plan. that is that is part of our plan. We're not going to, uh, uh, okay. we can do it with maps too. We can, yeah. we can, we can do it, uh, we can show the extent of Say an RSL or a, a MCL exceeds map, uh, and you can have a line. So okay, after ten years of, of migration, this is what it looks like. And after twenty years, you know, you know, and so that'll we can predict that, and, and that that 
that ring that MCL or seeds line could get bigger and bigger and bigger in certain areas. In some areas, it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller because we have treatment going on. So it's going to change. So we're that's we're, we are working on that right now. And, okay. and so the graphs that I provided in the presentation is just just kind of one little snippet of. Would we expect to see that as part of the final report then? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that would be highly interesting. Hey, Hank, uh, just, just for the sake of um, that, that um, pictorial there, and it, it, um, I, I just wanted to clarify that all of Site 8 is not moving south. I, I just thought it would be important to just sort of... Um, right. And, and, so I, I just want to make sure that there's not the expectation that it's all moving south, that, you know, lion's share. That's, that's a good point. And I'll just explain, I think it was mentioned earlier uh, about... Uh, I, um, I, you know, Mike, maybe you mentioned it, uh, or or Chris mentioned it about how this is going to get divided up, and it was presented in the presentation. This this line here with this little circle, and and it goes over. This is uh, our float. Well, it's kind of an arbitrary thing, uh, but it's our our flow field designation. So anything on the including the circles here, anything north is what we're calling flow field one. And anything south is flow field two. We have these circles because these this contour, you can see this oval here. This is a high point, and there's a high point over here too. And this is our groundwater highs for the base. The water is split there. This is so it's it's flowing, it's flowing to the north and it's flowing to the south. So uh so site eight is actually contributing contaminants. Contaminants are migrating from site eight northward into newington and southward into into the flight line area and the same thing for these two sites here so the, these are split and they're, and they're flowing in two different ways thank you that was helpful and the report's going to be structured that way it's going to be we'll talk about uh the sites in flow field one and and we'll talk about all the sites that are contributing to flow field one and then we'll talk about you know migration pathways in flow field one and then we'll talk about all the and that's one whole big section and then the other section is all the sites within flow field two the source areas and then how that how that is it how all those sites migrate through flow field two also taking into account the hydrogeology where under the airfield You've got more transmissive uh, soils so that the contaminants can move more readily through portions of peas, whereas uh, other parts have uh, finer grain sediments, lower hydraulic conductivities, less transmissive but for the contaminants to move through. Right. So this is what he's referring to here is, yeah, is but, this yeah. this map here. I'll zoom out so you can see it a little bit better. But this is a uh, I'll just turn the um, Contours off, so it's a little busy. Uh, and, and, and I know the different compounds will have different rates based on the size of the molecule. Yes, yeah. that's right. And and so this this is a mapped uh, sand and gravel or or, or uh, well, it's an aquifer. Uh, uh, it's a glacial deposit, and the darker the blue, the higher the, the permeability or the transmissivity uh, of, of that, and that's where. You know, you can see that's where the supply wells are, right? They're they're tapped into, uh, you know, they were smart back then. They 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 knew how to site these wells, uh, so they they put them in these deeper, coarse grain deposits. So these blue blue areas are, you know, it's much more transmissive. A lot more water moving through here, um, and so so contaminants going to move through there too. Uh, so they're you know, kind of their preferential path, so to speak. Thank you. I'm wondering if there are RAD members who haven't had a chance to share I don't questions. As, as, as hand raised for me. Jump in, please. Well, I certainly would defer to any any RAD member that hasn't had a chance to speak, but um, regarding site eight, the can um, someone comment on the effect of the improvements that you've outlined by uh, uh, make you know eliminating uh, 
old uh, outflows and putting in new ones on the operating potential of the plant. It continues, as I read, to be at 55% of the potential for its effectiveness. There's... And we're, we're looking at a remedy. We're not gonna get to a record of decision for till the end of 2026 at best. It sounds like longer given the complexity, which is understandable. So I'm very interested at, again on what, what is being done to make site eight work better. The thanks, Mike. The 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 trenches that were discussed that were uh, given an overview in the in the slide presentation don't necessarily have a direct correlation of what, what's restricting our flows uh, in the plant currently. Okay, uh, our challenges are with the with the uh, with the water that were uh, that were that's available to that plant, and in in particular the high iron wells that make up the majority of the extraction wells for that facility. So uh, upcoming improvements that are being discussed are optimization efforts to treat that water more effectively that allows us to uh, increase those influent rates into that plant. Pre-treatment, uh, uh, different filtration systems as, we, as that water enters the plant before it's, before it's treated. So those type of things are being discussed with the Air Force now, currently, uh, to get the, that plant optimized to get those rates increased. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, Mike. So they're right. WSP and would have been in discussions. Regulators have been involved as well as the possible changes to that to that plant. <clears throat> Maybe bring bring in some more technologies that are more like Ames or the Grafton plant that are seeing really highly successful rates. Um, you know, maybe increasing the you know the GAC filters as well. Um, possibly switch into a single pass resin to free up some space so that we can put in some of these pre treatments to really increase that uh, increase that flow through there. And then of course in the future, you know, we're not ruling out you know additional wells uh, and things like that. So I mean, yes, we are absolutely on board with you. We are looking for ways to optimize and get that uh, get that system running at a higher capacity and uh, make make a bigger difference there. So yeah, thank you for your question. But yes, we are absolutely looking into this. It's one of my priorities um, as well. So it's. It's in the works. Well, it, it has the potential for rewards when you look at the effectiveness of the uh, efforts you've made with Ames on, you know, on the south end uh, that was just outlined. Uh, when you you see the uh, significant reduction that you've achieved, and you know, it's important. Obviously, that's a municipal water supply, but there are people drinking water coming north of site A in, uh, in Newington. Thank you. Sure. you bet. And like I said, it's a priority for us and we are, you know, we are, I'm, I'm currently in discussions with uh, my leadership and with contracting as well to get some of these changes implemented sooner rather than later, just because it is such a high value to us. Um, so more to come on that as, that as that develops. Thank you for your question. Great. Rab members, final, any questions or comment now before we go to our water city water update? Just like yeah, for Amy, you said there are no more um, sampling protocols going to be introduced this this season. Basically, just follow up testing on on eggs. Yeah, well, yeah, right. So the uh, you know we need to focus on report writing at this, this point. So yeah. we, we also partially on. Um, they were partially referring to um, had a, a short conversation that I suppose we should probably mention here about the honey. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. He had asked a question, so it, um, and so we had a short discussion just about whether or not it was you know what about honeybees. You know, we did all this produce sampling. Um, we definitely saw lots of honeybees out there. We know there's a lot of people with with, uh, with bees um, actively uh, in the area. So you know, it's it's a question of you know if we decide it's a possible active pathway, you know, is it something that could be done at a later date, even if it can't be you know pulled into this RI because timeline um and it you know potentially is so it's something that we're gonna definitely think about moving forward um we do still have i think there's what sampling for uh maple syrup we are going to use maple sap this spring that was mentioned um, and then yeah something else 
that's it. Thank you. All right, let's go to our water city of water presentation for a few minutes. Al, you can come anyway. Uh, Kim, raise your hand. Oh, Kim, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. Real quick. Um, is the PFAS that's being removed, being destroyed, being incinerated, or is it still being landfilled? Yeah, it's being landfilled on the Class C River landfill, landfill, so nothing's being incinerated that has PFAS in it from Air Force activities. Can we request, or can I request, that we go back to incinerating it? Um, I currently wish I could, it's, but it's against, the, it's against the Air Force's policy or the DOD policies right now per the NDAA. So we have a current moratorium on waste incineration. Therefore, we have gone the route of going to Class C hazardous waste landfills as a precautionary method of disposal. But the EPA will eventually have a ruling on the types of PFAS destructions that are going to be allowed. Um, I don't know if anybody has heard when those are coming out. I don't think it's for another year or more, unfortunately. Um, Mike, I don't know if you've heard anything about that, but to my knowledge, um, there are no rules yet on what we can do with PFAS other than put them in the, in the landfills. Will you be able to extract them and treat them later when the ruling comes through of how they can be destroyed? Once they're in the landfill, definitely. Well, it just feels very irresponsible to take this problem we have and distribute it elsewhere. Thank you. Oh, so like, serious all the time in this committee, because it has to be, but it's really hard. Um, thanks for all of that. A lot of really good topics um, from many of you and lots of great helpful responses. Thanks for that conversation. Let's go to Al uh, Pratt. Um, for your update. Brief update on the uh, East Drinking Water Treatment Facility at Grafton Road. I know some of you were on the tour during the last RAD meeting, so if there's any questions that come up that you have from that RAD meeting, I can uh, try to answer them now. Um, plan is still running great. Um, not much has changed since the RAD meeting. At this time, we've uh, treated about 376 million gallons through the treatment plant. Uh, we're still sampling monthly throughout the treatment process there. No long change compounds have been seen or detected coming through either the resins or the GAC. Um, so that's all good. Um, we are, it's been a little over a year and a half now. We've been running. Um, April will be sort of the anniversary of two years. So we are making plans to change out of one of the carbon vessels as well as three of the resin treatment trains. Right now, we're planning on the GACs. Once the GAC change out in March, and if all goes well, we'll be changing out three of the, the resin trains in April. And that will get us on a good operational cycle. I know the resins had a warranty period of two years. We're hitting that in April. And we'll get on a, a change out schedule where every two years we'll be changing out the resins, and the GACs will be every three years we'll change out the GACs. So that's sort of a, a way to predict our, our cost moving forward and changing these out. Um, and we're still running the pilot study there. We still have the four different uh, exchange resins. Um, we've been running that for about four months now. All the resins are looking really good. Um, still not seeing any of the long chains. So this is what we're seeing with the, the exchange resins. They're really great at taking out the long chains. We're seeing some of the short, short chains coming through. So we're able to start mapping those. Um, they're all coming in quite well. So we'll continue doing that as long as we can. We want to see some long chains so we can really See where the breakthrough is, see how long we can push these uh, resins. Um, but that's it for the update. Any questions you have, would be good. Andrea, go ahead. Um, I'm going to What short chains are breaking through? A PFBA is always the first one that comes through. And we're seeing that around 30 parts per trillion. Uh, PFPEA is coming through the resins at this point. Um, and I can't play with concentration of the oil and. Um, and then PFHXA, those are the three that you know the short chains that typically come through the plant. We saw those in the pilot study too. Mm -hmm. And are those those compounds breaking going through to the water that's going out to these? The PFBA yes. is the only one that's in the like finished final water yep. at like thirty parts per trillion. Yep. Yep. Okay. 
Um, and then what will you do with the resin and the gas when you're all done? So will that also go to a landfill? Yeah, we're following the Air Force's guy on that. So the all the resin is going to be shipped down to the same, I think it's going to be the same Class C landfill that they're using. Um, it's basically manifest under Air Force's control since they own the waste, essentially. And the, the carbon is going to be reactivated, sent back to Caligon where we got the carbon and it'll be reactivated for future use. Is, do you know what the reactivation process is? Like, how do they get rid of the PFAS that it collects? And like, so essentially they reuse it, right? Yeah, it's heated to extreme temperatures with steam, I believe, or something to reactivate. Um, and do we get that same one back or no? We'll get the same one back. Okay. There'll be a lot of testing along with that when we get it back. Um, it's common practice, according to Calgon, this is, this is what they do. We're at a good advantage where our carbon is hardly used at all. Since it's at the end of our treatment train, there's really no one in it. So uh, we feel pretty safe for using that. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for Al? Right. Thank you. It's time for public comment. So participants um, from the public who are here virtually or in person, you can have a few minutes to talk. I think we have up to three minutes. I don't know if we're going to have much interest in that, but um, participants in the webinar, you would be listed as an attendee, right? You can raise your virtual hand and let us know if you're interested in making comments. And for people in the room here, if you can just let us know. I I think we're mostly staff side here. <laughs> so, um, all right. Do we have Pam? What are you seeing on the participants? Uh, nothing, nothing so far, but just a reminder to attendees the raise hand functions at the bottom of your screen. And if you're on the phone, I believe it's star right. nine to raise your hand. Or star six. If or star six. Right, yeah. It's one of the two, one of the numbers. Any public comment tonight? Anybody else who wants to share thoughts on all of this? I don't think this has ever happened. I think that means the RAD members are raising all the questions. Thank you. Um, all right. Let's, I'm going to open the floor then for a few more minutes for the Brad, if there's anything else that you'd like to go into further, uh, members, anything you were like, oh, if only I could have asked one or two follow-ups to really understand something. Now is a great time to do that. Easier to do it now than later. Anything else? I just wanted to say, is Mike Donnie, you still on the horn? Yeah, there you are. Mike, um, you know, you, you brought up earlier about your ability to, um, so I, I talked to you on the screen. I know I, I should be looking in this owl. It's just really hard to concentrate and do that. But then, you know, you're in, you, you feel like you need some tools to communicate uh, with your with your communities. And um, I don't know, the, the map that you saw today and also the ones that were in the, the presentation that showed, you know, not only the points where, the, where some of these, uh, you know, the samples were collected, but those contour maps. So you could at least show to your, your neighbors or your community members where the extent of the PFAS is. So that's something that will help you because we can get those to you. And, um, yeah, it, it it would it would help if um, the presentation materials were uh, similar to the approach that Mike Daly uh, mentioned. To get, bear in mind that, excuse me, uh, if the uh, materials were divided in, it would allow for a better scale between north and south of site A. If, yeah. if you treated it as two different areas, one area north of site A, so you'd get what's coming off site A going north and what's the extent of that. And the obviously where the focus has been until of late, everything going south of site A the 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 scale is and I know they can be enlarged on on your computer screen I mean it's one of the few things I'm probably capable of doing but uh, 
that doesn't really make for uh, uh, any, it, it, you lose any kind of global look then. You, you're zooming in on, you know, a very small area. And given the lack of detail, you lose any ability to try to figure out where the, where it is. It's just, uh, I appreciate the offer. And I, I think if we could, you know, if we could have a technical session on that, the, the way we had a technical session working towards, you know, some of the, the design of some of the remedial investigation, um, I think we could, uh, make some headway, but I have a hard time seeing how it's going to uh, substitute for being able to do more disclosure. But I'm, uh, I, I, I'm quite willing to work on it with you, and I appreciate the, the offer. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure there are other folks from the I, you know, Andrea will work tire, tirelessly on anything for the, for this organization, but maybe some of us, the rest of us can relieve her of, of this thing and work on that. Uh, particularly if we, you know, we, we need some additional members from Newington. That's, that's pretty clear with, it's two of us tonight and, you know, this is a major thing for that town, whether they appreciate it or not. Right. It's 800 you. people. Yes, and I believe we do have some applicants currently for the red post. I, I, I'm aware of that, so that's good. I, I'm not scaring any of them off. Uh, <laughs> as long as they don't watch this. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. I don't know, reading the room in the in-person room, things are pretty mellow and kind of quiet. I don't get the sense that there's a lot of topics just waiting to bust out. For those RAB members on Zoom, anything else you want to mention or raise at this point before we start wrapping up? All right, I'd like to give each RAB member a chance to share final thoughts. Just any closing remarks you want to, and I'm going to call on people and Kim can help me make sure I don't miss anybody. Um, Kim, you want to share closing remarks and then we've got a mic down again. I, th I think I made my uh, feelings and thoughts clear, but thank you. Thank you. Mike Donahue and then Mike Daly. All set. Thank thanks. Daily and then Andrea. Uh, no, it's good to. I, I hope might get some more help um, in, uh, for Newington. So that would be uh, that would be uh, that would help. And I, I think I understand what you're saying, Mike. In regards, I, I mean, I I appreciate again. I think you're trying to look out for the town. Um, I, I, and, I, and I think I know what you're looking for. And I think we should. You know, I think through the the, the working meetings you suggest, um, I think we could probably again hopefully accommodate. I guess that information sharing as it relates to, you know, information more specific to Newington. So I, I can appreciate we, when you're looking at, you know, 30,000 feet and you're looking at the pretty much almost the whole peninsula. So uh, the Peace Peninsula, I, I, I can uh, certainly appreciate where your where your mind, where your eyes are focused relative to the town. And um, so I, I think that I, I think that can be accommodated and, and uh, certainly, you know, extra eyes on it from the town would certainly, again, be a help to you and, and to the town, you know, generally. So, um, you know, I hope, I hope uh, whoever has applied will, you know, can, you know, will, uh, can support or help and um, uh, help the town. So that, that would be, that, that'd be great. Thank you. Andrea and then Jared. Um, thank you. Um, I guess I, I have a few closing thoughts. I do want to just reiterate thanking uh, Mindy Mesmer, Ted Connors, Jean Trigger, and Joan Hamlet for their contributions to the RAB. Really sad to see them go. Um, 
and you know, I definitely am looking forward to adding, adding some new members and um, getting more perspectives on this and just the importance of making these meetings really meaningful and engaging so people do want to stay on them and participate because I think this is a long haul and we do need to stay engaged on it. So um, thank you to those that have served and I'm looking forward to adding some new members. Um, I also do want to recognize that I want to thank the Air Force for intervening in those private wells. I know that was, you know, a friction point a couple of years back. Uh, so the wells that were below EPA's advisory, but above New Hampshire's MCLs, thank you for following through on that. That's important and appreciated. Um, and then lastly, yeah, I just, you know, with the NDAA update, um, you know, I think initially the first slide was disappointing. There was some more information on the second slide that was provided tonight. And that, you know, I think we we need to come to a better middle point where the data can be shared with the community in a meaningful way. And um, I hope the Air Force will continue to stay open-minded and work with the state. And also um, thank you to Senator Shaheen and her staff for all their efforts on trying to find a middle ground here so that this can be, this can benefit all of us. So I hope that we can continue to see progress on that front as well moving forward and just it's really nice to see you guys in person. So thanks for the meeting. Um, Jared and then Matt Casey. Uh, I don't have any additional comments. Matt and then Brian. Yeah, uh, just appreciate hearing all the updates. And I certainly take you know the takeaways back to the base and discuss it with leadership so we understand uh, what's going on with the ongoing investigation. Um, you know, with all the construction work we do have going on base, we want to know where these hotspots are and make sure we're, um, you know, taking that into consideration. So uh, appreciate all the updates and comments. Thanks. Brian and then Samuel. Yeah, <laughs> glad to hear that, you know, the monitoring is going to continue because I know we talk a lot about predictors, but the data speaks for itself. So that's good, just like Al was able to talk about what we see, what we really see, what's going on in the water system, how the treatment system's working. Um, and, uh, you know, as Al and I swap seats, um, I won't be far, but I know, uh, you know he's doing a great job, um, just like Chris has done, um, taking over for Roger. And Chris had the same, has the same knack as Roger of picking a meeting in January when the snow's come. <laughs> I remember when I talked to you last week, he said, I know it's gonna snow, here comes the snow. You know? So what, tell us when next January meeting's coming, Chris, so then we'll know. We can all plan for, you know, a couple snow days at school, skiing, getting uh, better, you know. So. <laughs> okay. uh -huh. I don't think it's looking dull as next time. Maybe maybe I can make it a jersey or something more fun. <laughs> Samuel and then Peter. Oh, so did I understand we did, we did get a couple applications? Or? We did get a couple applications. So oh. we're, they're going to be reviewed, and then the co-chairs will come to that. Yeah, well, I agree. I mean, the more I get involved in this, the more I realize this is so, you know, of vital importance to Newington and has been you know, long before I got here, of course, but it's going to be ongoing for many years. Um, 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 so I'm going to look forward to seeing the report. Thank you all in advance for working on it, fighting it out, whatever has to happen. I wish a little bit as a community member we get to see some uh, more comments and stuff was good. That'll be uh, useful. But um, more sooner we can see that the better and start uh, preparing ourselves. So. Peter. I want to second you know, what Andrea said, thanking the Senator and the Air Force, the uh, Senator's office, the Air Force, Andrea. For, for working hard on trying to resolve these these data sharing issues, they're certainly very frustrating. Um, but I don't want that to overshadow the amount of work that's gone into this report. I really appreciate uh, the all these folks that have worked for years collecting a lot of data, and it's really gotten us farther down the road. Um, there's, there's there's a good story to be told in this report when we get it, and. Uh, Looking forward to getting work with the group. Great. I'm going to go to Chris in a second. Did I skip any other RAD members? Did I get you all? Trying to get everybody. Chris, final thoughts. Yeah, that's um, 
kind of keep taking away from Peter there. Um, yeah, this, there's been a lot of great work going on here. And I know these red meetings can seem kind of tense at times, but this is a good group. And we uh, we, we share, you know, we work together very well. And the, the team that is put together is a, is a stellar one. Like, like Peter said, this is going to be some good things that come out of this report and all the continued work that we're doing. And, and we appreciate the community's involvement. And we thank the red members that um, have stuck it out. And those who, of you who have left, and, you know, we thank you again. And thank you for, you know, promoting other applicants as well uh, to keep this thing going. So everybody that's... It's been a good thing, and it's a uh, you know, again NDAA. We still work in progress, more to come, and we'll let you get to know as uh, things develop in that regards. And um, yeah, thanks. Great. Um, hope you all have a wonderful night. We will be posting the recording online in the next week, sort of, um, so you can share with anybody who wants to see it and missed it. And be well, travel safe, and we will be in touch soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.